Um, oh, good. More people are coming. I'm Liza. I'm the program librarian here at Norman Williams. And um, I'm going to first introduce Ham. And then basically, I'm going to get the ball rolling. And we both have things we want to touch on. And it's going to be open to conversation and questions. And hopefully, we'll leave here with um, energized and informed. So Ham Gillett grew up in Woodstock and has been involved in various aspects of recycling and composting and solid waste management for three decades or so. Mm. Um, for his first job, he assisted in the development of Woodstock Recycling and Refuse Corp, way back when Woodstock first started mandated recycling. And uh, he's probably going to talk about this, so I won't talk about future. You can talk about that. Oh, OK. Well, I'll talk about it. I wasn't going to, but I'll make a note okay. to talk about it. Um, his current official titles right now are um, with two different solid waste um, management districts. The first one is Program Outreach Coordinator for the Greater Upper Valley, and the other is the Outreach Coordinator for South Windsor, Wyndham Counties. And I also want to mention that the Norman Williams Public Library um, is an active member of the Sustainable Library Initiative. And we're currently working towards sustainable library certification, which is this incredibly long list of tasks that we need to complete to get certified. And we're working our way through them. And um, it's been very eye-opening, I have to say. We're evaluating everything from purchasing to our operating to how we dispose of things, you know, where we get light bulbs, not only what light bulbs, but where they come from, our printers and our paper. And uh, it's, been, it's been a really uh, fascinating, it is a really fascinating process. So without further ado, I'd like to start big picture and then work to the nitty gritty details. And I'm concerned about the role of manufacturers and producers in the big picture of conservation and our role as consumers and how they interact. Um, and, uh, <laughs> You touched a sore spot. <laughs> OK. Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, it's a big deal. It's getting to be uh, discussed more and more um, these days. In fact, in the legislature, there's a just, they're just about to pass an extended producer responsibility law, um, which is going to make manufacturers of, uh, I believe it's, um, hazardous waste, it's going to make them responsible for covering the cost of the end of life disposal. Um, now already we, I'm going, to, I'm going to get into the weeds a little bit already, but, but Vermont already has a pretty um, progressive uh, extended producer responsibility uh, law in terms of paint, batteries, um, light bulbs, and electronics. And that, what that means is that any one of the manufacturers of any of those materials uh, has to pay into a program which helps to cover the cost of recycling. So when you go to Ace Hardware and you buy a gallon of paint, um, it's, the price is just going up. But it used to be you'd pay 99, 99 cents extra to the paint care program. And that allows you to bring your paint can back to Ace Hardware or any participating transfer station, uh, and it will be taken and uh, reused or recycled. And it's not going to get not going to end up in a, in a landfill no matter what happens. The same with um, with fluorescent bulbs, any mercury-containing bulbs. The same with um, batteries. Uh, all batteries in the state of Vermont are now recyclable and need to be recycled. Um, and what was the third? Oh, electronics. Um, it's called the Vermont e-waste program. So any computer, computer-related device, in in including tabletop printers and television sets, uh, can be recycled anywhere at any transfer station in the state of Vermont for free for you. So those are just some examples of, of extended producer responsibility. It's becoming a huge problem, and particularly with packaging. 
because every time we turn around, something else is is wrapped in. Remember when I used to be able to, you could go to a hardware store and get a tape measure. Well, now you get it wrapped in blister wrap and blah, 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 blah. So all that stuff right now is just going to the landfill because um, there's no way to recycle it. So yeah. it doesn't, I'm not sure that really answers Well, yeah, your... it does. It's, it's, it's the big picture. It's not just, um, it's, it, it, it's how can we as consumers also go and tell the hardware stores or tell the people who are making the tape measures we don't want all this other stuff. Yeah. And it seemed like a couple of years ago, there was a movement. And now it's sort of, maybe the pandemic undid it because we were all shopping online because we had to. That's part of it. But it seems like that movement that I loved that was like no packaging or minimal packaging for things that had to be packaged, like a box of screws, um, that seems to have gone the other way. And I'm wondering if there's a reason for that or um, I think it's, well, one of the reasons I, to get back, I, th is, I, I think it's because we have, we as consumers, we have, we're, we're inviting all of that stuff into our lives. Mm. And, um, and the, the manufacturers don't care. They want to market it any way they can to get us to buy it. And so um, I had a friend who's, uh, she's no longer whinnying with us as... <laughs> Dylan Thomas would say, but she lived down in Arlington, Vermont. She would go to the grocery store and she would take the packaging off everything and she'd leave it at the checkout counter and she'd say, you deal with it, I'm not dealing with it. She was very ornery and I'm sure she made herself very unpopular. But I think if, if, if all of us <laughs> did that, you would back up the system and something would, would have to be done. Um, it's, hmm. it's, I, I myself feel overwhelmed by it most of the time because I just, I don't know, um, you know, certain states are like Vermont, like Maine, like uh, Massachusetts and, and California are, are creating these laws. But it, it's really hard because it's all about the bottom line is, is, is money. Mm -hmm. And the manufacturers don't want to be held responsible and have to pay anything out because in the end, we're all going to end up paying for it. Like, you know, we, have, we belong to the paint care program but we now pay a dollar extra a can to get rid of it. But if we, if we didn't pay at the counter, we pay in taxes for the processing. Exactly. So it's almost like we're rewarding the people who are not paying attention. And those of us who are choosing one with the less packaging are ending up paying twice. Yes. Okay. Well, but what I do, I mean, I'm, I'm very vocal about it, and I also am constantly sending emails to companies about, you know, what, like, like I, I wear one of those CPAP machines, and I just got, um, I needed one piece to it to be replaced. I had it, you know, wrapped up with duct tape for a year, and finally that fell apart. And, you know, I could not get just this. I got last week in the mail a box with were all of the replacement parts, all of it plastic, and these little air filters that you have to put in, in the machine. Each one was wrapped in a separate plastic package, and so I got right online, and I fired off this email, and I said, what are you people doing? You know, you're, you're, you're trashing the planet, and I'm sure they just think I'm a crack, but uh, a quack, but I, I, my point is, mm -hmm. speak up. Everybody has to speak up and if you know speak up at the retailer speak up to the write the manufacturer email them say I'm sick of this you you know and make them make it personal somehow mm -hmm. but see I told you you touched a nerve yeah I guess but it's 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 an important one because that's the system that we're working within and it feels like we need to change that to make real progress right we're I mean, all just putting it in the right bin, whether it's recycling or compost or trash. There's a step before that we could take. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, I agree. And it's and it's and it's we're 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 held prisoners. Um, just so you know, I'm gonna I was gonna touch on this, but I'm gonna just say it now because it's kind of related. We hold the solid waste district has two hazardous waste collections a year. Um, one four hour collection last year cost us $51,000. Mm -hmm. 
and we were throwing away Windex, uh, rug shampoo, everything. And I, you know, my pl my, I plead to people, first of all, if you can buy a non-toxic alternative, please do. But we take so much of this for granted. It's just so easy to walk into Walmart or Ace Hardware or whatever and just grab what we want off the shelf, but you have no, you, you know, we don't think about where that's going to end up. And um, so I'm now asking people to, um, to, if you've got, you know, if you've got cleaning supplies that you don't want, put them on the listserv, tell your friends, whatever. But we are about $51,000 for a four hour. They charge it, one company charged us $16,000 just to set up at the Hartford Transfer Station. This is for the gang to get in there, the crew to get in their Tyvek suits, set up all the barrels, the trucks, the blah, 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 blah. But, but well, your point is that a lot of it wasn't toxic waste. It was usable. It was completely usable. And it also, you know, you can make window cleaner out of um, detergent and, and lemon juice and vinegar. Um, and I know a lot of people are resistant to that, but I just, I just, I, I told Eliza, Eliza before I started, I, I, if, if I get one thing across today, it's going to be to hammer home to people. Number one, to, to don't buy what you don't need. And please, at the end of its life, don't throw it in the landfill if somebody else can use it. Um, more on that later. Yeah. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that, I know that um, oftentimes, like humane societies and other nonprofits, are hungry for cleaning supplies. They don't have to be full containers, and they don't have to be um, like like the food shelf may want sealed containers for obvious reasons, but um, the, the humane societies need to clean all the time. Mm. And if you've got leftover cleaning supplies, that's a you know, usually they, they'll, they're more than happy to take them. Um, and towels. Yeah, and towels. Towels and blankets, not electric. Yeah. Um, and then uh, along the same lines of the policy, the last time I checked, the made to repair was still being discussed in Montpelier. Do you have any updates on that? I, I don't. I okay. know it's it's in it's in discussion, it's and still I know discussion. that I don't know if any of it, any of you have heard of a repair. Fair. So the made to repair. Well, well no, I think related relate it to, relate it to okay. what we've been talking so, about. So, um, so much is now electronic and or sealed that when you buy things, if they break minorly, it's really hard to repair them. Well, like your, your, your machine. Mm -hmm. You couldn't just get the part and fix it because they want to sell you a whole new one or they want the dealer's of the tractor or the computer or whatever to have the um, monopoly of fixing it. Whereas there are crews of people out there saying, ah, that's silly. I mean, yes, yeah, some things need specialized equipment or our cars are so much computer, they're really computers on wheels, but there are still things we could fix if we could access them. And it's that um, ability to access the manuals to repair for me, it's little things like sewing machines, but for farmers, it's huge because they have to take their equipment out of service to bring it to a dealership instead of being able to you know, unscrew the cover and fix it. And so the, the repair part of manufacturing and consuming is also this huge question. Yeah, there was just an, an article in the, um, a letter to the editor in the Valley News the other day from a, a, a group of loggers saying, okay. And it was addressed to the, you know, to, to the folks in Montpelier. We want to be able to repair our own equipment. And when you say take it to a dealership, well, in Vermont, you know, it's not just down the block. And so that's part of it. The other, and I don't want to break into what you're yep, talking about. Fine. I just a PS onto that. The the the, the small consumer uh, aspect of that is is um, we. You, I, you may have read about it. There are these things called repair fairs, which mm -hmm. um, I think there was one in there was one in Sharon, maybe this weekend, maybe last weekend. But it's 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 not so much um, big equipment, but it's teaching people how to sew a button on or 
what the very, very briefly, what happens is that in, um, I want to do one this year. So if any of you have talents in repairing anything, please step up. Um, but you, you, uh, you gather a, a group of people who know how to fix, how to put in a, um, fix a lamp or repair the leg on a chair or uh, do a zipper or whatever. And then you invite them to come to the library or the church basement or the community center. And um, they, you, they each have a table and then you have people bring in their lamps and it's, a, it's, there, it's supposed to be, a if it's designed well, it's supposed to be a communal event. So you don't come in and drop off your lamp. You come in and you sit down at the table with the person who's fixing your lamp and you learn how to do it yourself and you talk and you meet somebody new. But uh, it started in, in Europe a number of years ago and it's finally beginning to catch on yeah. here. But it, that's, you know, that's re repairing on a much, it's, yeah. it's ha allowing us as consumers uh, the capability and giving us the power back to be able to fix our own stuff rather than saying, oh, this thing's broken, I'm going to throw it away. So. Yeah. so we need to talk about the repair fair because it's on my agenda too. Um, and to that, to that um, point, there is a mending circle that meets at the library um, the second, no, the first and third, no, the second and fourth Wednesdays of the month. Um, at two o'clock on Wednesday, and people just bring their mending and help each other. Some people are accomplished seamstresses, other people are um, sewers, I'm supposed to call us now. Um, other people have never sewn on a button and, or hemmed, a, hemmed a, uh, um, anything. So it's, it's fun, and it's just two o'clock, make a cup of tea, come on down, bring your mending, and um, we all learn, we all learn. It's, it's been interesting, I mean, I've been sewing for most of my life. And I, I learned something the last time we, we had a, a meeting. So wow. there you go. Do they do alterations? <laughs> we can help you figure out how you can do alterations. And we are working on um, having a sewing machine to lend out from the library. We're not there yet. But we're working on that. Working on having a sewing machine to be able to lend from the library. But we're, we're not quite there yet. I was working on that yesterday. So that's the, the, the regulation end yeah. of it. And yeah. we can affect it. It's harder. But we can also affect our purchasing. And I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering what your, um, you know, besides like what Ham was saying, you know, choosing non-toxic ingredients, um, there are, there are uh, sneaky things like the, Plastic label, okay, this is something I learned from one of your other talks. Oh, good. The uh, laundry detergent that I was using, I no longer use it, said in six-point type on the label that you had to peel the plastic label off of the plastic jug before you could recycle the jug. It now, was really you, true. Okay, you told me that because I didn't know so that. Somebody thought, said, somebody oh, okay, who called somebody, in said right. it. So Outrageous. after the call... I went downstairs to my laundry room and I looked at it and I was like, those sneaks, you know, yes, this is a recyclable container, but if all those containers I've thrown into recycling actually became contamination for the recycling lot, it undid not only what I was trying to do, but what a, a whole truckload of other people were trying to do. So it means we really, really need to pay attention. and. Um, I was shocked. Yeah. Obviously, so I, I still am. <laughs> but um, those, those sneaky things. And so we're now trying these sheets that come in flat, plas flat cardboard, card, uh, board stock packaging. So I yeah. don't know. I don't know what goes into making the sheets because then you have to research how the sheets are made. And it's, it's very it's complicated, but I think we all need to pay way more attention than I've been paying, and I thought I was paying attention. Mm -hmm. So that was that. So um, do you want to say something about wish cycling? I think that goes with the plastic label. Oh, yes. Uh, has anybody heard the term wish cycling? Never yet. It's, it's been before. Um, it's, I'm not a big proponent of single stream recycling. Um, I, I long for the days, which will never happen, when we all had to sort everything 
at, it's called source separation, and you were, had 12 bins in your pantry and you had to put, mm -hmm. you'll never go back. Um, mm -hmm. But what's happened with single stream is that we all, myself included, um, because we put all our recyclables in one bin, this is usually with plastics, uh, I would say, uh, predominantly. But you look at it and you say, oh, it's plastic, that's recyclable. When there may not be a recycling symbol on it, it may not be recyclable. And um, it's just so easy to, you feel great if you can throw something plastic in the recycling bin. Well, uh, you are basic, if you throw something in that's the wrong type of plastic, you've basically contaminated like you said, the whole load. And chances are that that whole load is not gonna to go to the materials reco recovery facility, it's gonna go straight to the landfill because the hauler doesn't wanna deal with sorting it. So um, I would just caution every, and it's, it is called wish cycling, and um, I catch myself still doing it. I, a lid on the yogurt, you know, I think, well, the containers, is a number five, and I know that they recycle number five. I don't see, oh, it's probably just too small, and I'll put it in, mm -hmm. and I think that little voice says, get it out, put it in the trash. So I would urge everybody to only recycle. Uh, in Vermont, we are required by law to recycle ones and twos plastic, that's One. it. Ones, number ones and number twos. Some towns, some haulers will take number five. But don't try to recycle anything else. Don't try to recycle anything that's smaller than two inches because the facility over in Rutland that Casella runs, it's called a MRF, a materials recovery facility. What happens is that Casella or whoever, Able Waste will pick up a truckload of recyclables. They take them to this facility. They dump them on the floor at the bottom of this uh, conveyor belt which runs all the materials up into a whole system of where it's sorted by machine and human beings. But the grating on the conveyor belt that carries all the materials up into the recycling area is two inches. So if you put a bottle cap in there or a medicine bottle in there, anything that's smaller than two inches, it goes, it goes down through, it gets gummed up in the machinery, and then they have to clean it up. So I know some people who keep a two by two sticky note or whatever on their recycling bin, and if they have a question, they take you know the cap and they go, Oop, "That's too small, throw it in the trash." Or you can put them in a like a coffee can. Yes. Uh, some I'm told you is that a plastic coffee can no, or no, it's a metal coffee can. And do what with them? You can't recycle them. They're too small. But if you put them in a coffee can, what's going to happen when that coffee can goes to the facility? The top's going to come off and the caps are going to fall. Yeah. Um, the only way, I mean, I, there are two theories on this. Some people say, do I put my caps on or my caps off? Yeah. Um, according to Casella, if you put your, if you're going to, if you have a bottle of water, hopefully you don't buy bottled water, but um, say uh, a bottle of Pepsi or something. If you put the, screw the, the cap on, it will stay on through the recycling process. And Casella claims that it will end up at the end of the process in a whole bunch of caps. I don't particularly, I, I would say err on the side of throwing your caps away rather than having them come off during the process. But um, I... Sorry, um, I don't mean to cut you off, but yeah. I have a couple of questions before yeah. we finish with that. Yep. Go May ahead. I speak then? Sure. Thank you. This is Barbara. Um, so about the nothing smaller than two inches, um, for clarification, uh, vitamin bottles that are longer, they're taller than two inches, but their diameter is not two inches, are those to be thrown away? or recycled? Yes, throw them away. Throw them away, thank you. Mm -hmm. And. Um, with the bottle caps, um, like on a bottle pop or, you know, I don't know, I try not to buy food products in plastic, but sometimes things are in that. But the, the, so I throw the lid away, but then there's like a plastic ring around that 
you know, you unscrew, you have to remove that plastic ring before putting the bottle in the recycle. Oh, the one that's, oh, I see. Yeah, the, the thing that the cap that was way? originally attached to. Um, yes. Um, no, I wouldn't, I do only because I'm obsessive about it, but um, it's, I think it's not necessary. Okay, and you mentioned cup, um, yogurt cups earlier, and um, if they're number fives, should we recycle them or should we throw them away? Depends on where do you live? Woodstock. Okay, where do you take your, where does, does you, are your recyclables picked up or do you take them somewhere? Um, they get picked up. Okay, they probably get picked up by Casella and Casella claims to, to recycle number five plastic. So yes, you can, if you live in Woodstock, you can recycle number five plastic. Hmm. Okay, but number two, one and two are the sure ones. They are required by the state. Okay. Yeah. And are there other plastic numbers that we should just throw away? Yes. Anything other than one, two, or five should go in the trash. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. What about those trays, like if you buy chicken, you know, the, are those recyclable? Like no. burger or whatever, chicken, you know, you need. You're, you're not, you're, are you talking about the styrofoam ones or yeah. the, styrofoam is not recyclable. Uh, I have to, I have to give an example and I'm going to make a plug. Uh, there's a group in New Hampshire uh, who have just started in the last two years running uh, styrofoam collections. It's uh, sponsored by the Lebanon Rotary Club and there's also a group which I, um, I know the members of it, I can't remember what they call themselves, but, um, and I don't want to take up a lot of time with this, but um, you, you can recycle styrofoam chicken meat trays, not black, but along with your styrofoam that comes in your Amazon package, not peanuts. Uh, there's going to be another one, somebody just called today about it, from Woodstock. Um, it's going to be uh, October 28th, and it's going to be at Jake's, behind Jake's Coffee and Car Wash in Lebanon, and I'll be posting it on a listserv. But um, thank you for asking. Um, and I'm just going to interject here, no black plastic of That's any the, kind. That was my next point. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. So there's a reason that, they, that even if it's a number two, you can't recycle black plastic because the eye, the electronic eye on the conveyor belt can't see it. Against the black Which, conveyor belt. I mean, it makes lots of... Yeah, that's what she's asking. What about blue? Uh, blue is okay, as far as I know, as long as it's... Uh, what number is it? Five. Yeah, yeah. In, thank you. Does anybody worry about this plastic... If it, if it comes off easy, I would peel it off. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. Because okay. it's going to go through quite a process to be, you know, actually recycled. Um, the other reason is that um, the, re uh, the recycling companies who, who actually recycle this stuff uh, don't want black because it makes everything an ugly color. So uh, no black plastic or black styrofoam. So how can we get the manufacturers to use a different color? Uh, I just emailed some company, oh, uh, I buy fish oil tablets, capsules, and uh, from Spectrum, this company called Spectrum. Sorry, Spectrum, but um, I emailed the customer service and said, Do you, are you aware that in mm. at least the New England states, you can't recycle uh, black plastic and um, you should care? And why can't you put it in an opaque, not an opaque, but a white container rather mm. than a black one? Um, yeah, of course they didn't answer me, but. <laughs> is it too small anyway, or is that a larger? It's a larger one, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Well, on to, um, there's lots we can go back through with this, but I want to um, talk about composting because we have some prime examples here on display. Da, 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 da. Uh, Vanna. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, door number one. No. Um, Anyway, this is a plug because this is the kind of composter that the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste District sells. They are, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, they're $65, and if you buy them from Walmart, they're 
at least 20 bucks more than that. Um, so I have some, a few of these in my car if anybody's interested. Or if you're um, out there in Zoom land, uh, call me or email me and we'll get one to you. Uh, this is a, also a, uh, this is a kitchen pail uh, from a company called Sure Clothes and it sure closes and stays closed. Um, those are six bucks and I have some of those too. But um, you want, oh, you want me to speak about food scraps? <laughs> Uh, so we all know that there uh, that it's a uh, it's a it's against the law in Vermont to throw food scraps in your trash, right? Mm -hmm. We all know that. Um, yeah, that law was passed almost three years ago. The reason being, and I had this on my list of things to talk about, we have one landfill left in the state of Vermont. It's way up in Coventry, which is about ten minutes from Canada, ten miles from Canada. It's owned by Casella. It's the only landfill in Vermont. When that place is full, we don't know where we're going to put another landfill. Nobody wants one in their town. Uh, they cost millions of dollars to construct. So we are trying to extend the life of that landfill as long as possible, which is why we are not put, we're not supposed to put our food scraps in our trash. If you are backyard composting, you may put your, food, your meat scraps and your bones uh, in your trash. You do not want to put them in your backyard compost because of rats and bears and whatever else. Um, I do know people who backyard compost and they save their meat scraps and bones in the freezer and then they take them to their local transfer station. Uh, and if you take your food scraps to your transfer station, those food scraps are going to go to a commercial composting facility where the big windrows are going to get to be 100 and at least, I think they have to be 100, minimum of 140 degrees to kill the pathogens. Um, so if your backyard, call, yeah, go ahead. I just want to put in a plug for Muted Mountain. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we've got them at the condos, um, condos now. Great. He's a, I don't know how that guy does it, but yeah. he's, uh, he he's blew amazing. into Vermont right during COVID and thought, hmm, I'm going to start a composting company, did some research, and he's all over the place, Zach Kavakis, he's great. Um, but thank you for that. Um, so your options are backyard, do it, do it yourself, it's free. Um, you can have it picked up curbside. It's rare, not a lot of towns have that, that, that ability or that service. Um, or you can take it to, if your local transfer station accepts food scraps, you can take it into the pretty sure they're going to pay for it. Does anybody use Able Waste, the drop yeah. off in Bridgewater? So I think they charge $4 or uh, six. It, oh, it's gone up. So it's six. Six were the recyclables and trash. Okay. Six. And it's a, it's a big bag, so you can fit yeah. quite a lot in it. Um, well, the food scrap is, I bring my kids back here too. It's not that big, but. Right. But the trash and recycling, yeah, it can be a big, big bag if you want. Yeah, yeah. Did you have a question? If you do backyard composting, what do you do in the winter? <laughs> Good question. Uh, I, I just keep putting my stuff out there and um, the voles will eat some of it. They'll come in underneath it. Um, but you're, it pretty much stagnates in the winter and then you just wait for it to thaw in the spring and, and your you know, pile, which was this high in, in uh, April, uh, it start, when it starts warming up, the pile will just shrink like that. So, but if you can't get to it, if you can't get to it, um, then you take it. You know, you probably should take it to Able or to a transfer station. Yeah. If I if I may jump in here, um, this is Barbara again. We um, don't have a place where we could set up a compost situation, and um, we also don't have the the materials to mix in to that you, one needs to have a, a good compost situation. So we um, got a green cone, and I do believe we heard about that from you, Mr. Gillett, and um, that's working very well for us. Oh, great. If one, one can fill it, you know, year round, we just keep the snow away from it and go out and um, fill it up. And actually, um, last year, it was, the lid was torn off and, we saw a huge um, 
claw scrapings on it. So it very clearly tried to get it at stuff, but unsuccessfully. So we just fixed it again and knock on wood, we haven't had any more trouble. But the green cone seems, at least for us, seems like a good solution when one can't set up a compost situation with all the material that one needs to mix in and that kind of thing. Thank you, Barbara. That's a great idea. A green cone, for anybody who doesn't know, it's a, uh, it's, um, it's a, the bottom, it comes in two pieces. The bottom half looks like an, ups, it's an upside down cone shaped laundry basket. It's plastic. And you dig a hole in the ground and you put it in the ground. So it's flush with the ground. The top is in, in the inverse of that. It looks like one of those orange cones on the, on the road, except it's green. And it, it, uh, it, I believe it screws and locks into place. It doesn't really, it doesn't make you any compost because no. uh, the critters, the, all the critters underground, the microbes will, will eat it and it will break down. But it serves the purpose of keeping it out of, um, out of your trash. Huh. And also it all, it, um, it's good for, um, it's, well, it's, it's obviously not completely bear proof, but it reduces the smell because everything's underground. Um, and they're, it's I, called a, it's called a solar digester. Thank so you. Yes, it yep. doesn't create the compost, but the sun, we or placed it in like a, the most sunny spot in the yard and it, it really does get hot, um, with hmm. the sun on it. If you have a family of five, I'm guessing that you would need a couple of them, but, um, it's not, it's not yeah. that big, but they do work. So thank you. So uh, just one comment about these um, composters. They're great. You do need to have a lot of brown matter, leaves, and stuff to make it work, which we didn't have enough of. So the bear got in, and we did another one and thought we were doing more brown matter, and that didn't work, and the bear got in. So then we got one of those barrels, the big old olive barrels, mm -hmm. and um, we turned it, and that seemed good until the bear decided, mm, we're going to take this and throw it down. I live on a hill threw it down the hill. It went about a quarter of a mile, landed in a creek, my neighbor's creek. Luckily, it didn't take out any animals or cars or people. Um, but that, we sort of gave up at that point. So we have curbside with Music Mountain. And we ended up with bits and pieces of this composter because we'd gone through three or four of them over the years. And we had an extra door and an extra side. So I called him and I said, so it's recycled plastic. Can we recycle it? No, it's black. <laughs> and the answer was no. no but, but typical ham said, I'll take the pieces, and when other people need repairs, we'll keep them in circulation. And that's what we did. And you know, I've used them all. You have. They're all gone. Good. Yep. There were a lot of them. <laughs> but, yeah. um, it, it, you know, sometimes the solution isn't going to work, but there's a solution to the solution, I guess, is my. Yeah, point these are that not story. very proof. And I get calls and emails all the time from people who've, who have gotten bears in their, um, in, their, in their compost. I was just on a uh, recycling coordinator's quarterly meeting this morning, and we had somebody from the Fish and Wildlife Department, and this woman gave this whole talk on bears in compost, which we, we sort of knew all of the information. But one thing we didn't know is she gave, showed a graph, and she said that last year the Fish and Wild Department the Wildlife Department received, I think she said 958 calls wow. about bears. And she said that's ranging from, we saw one, to there's one coming in our kitchen. Um, and it's a major, major problem. Um, if you live where there are bears, um, a couple of things I can suggest, no matter what kind of compost you're, I mean, if you're backyard composting, uh, get a strand of electric fence around it bait it with uh, pieces of aluminum foil and put bacon grease or peanut butter on it. The bear will come and touch that with its nose or its tongue or lips and it will get zapped and it won't come back. I'm told that bears have very good memories. The other thing is they hate uh, ammonia. So if you have a rag, you want to put ammonia in it and somehow stick it near or on your composter. Black bears can smell black oil sunflower sunflower seed from a mile away. Wow. So they will come to wow. get your bird seed, and then when they finished off your bird seed, they'll look around for other stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Well, I solved the problem. I had a bear come 
in. I didn't know I solved the problem, but it came, I found the lid to my trash can on the floor. Mm -hmm. And it was obvious that bags of trash had been taken. I don't know where he took them, right. but he never came back because he had two cats and I had put the kitty litter in <laughs> dirty diapers. And I don't think he Perfect. that was a good meal. <laughs> well, I'm going to add that to my list now <laughs> of bear deterrents, dirty <laughs> diapers. <laughs> And uh, what, what was Kitty it? Kitty litter. Oh, kitty litter. Oh, that's perfect. You know, funny thing, because I was green upping last week. This is off topic, but not, not all. Um, and I, I, was, I did like a less than a quarter of a mile between Windsor and Heartland. And um, just incredible the amount of trash and beer cans and bottles that are thrown. In. But um, I saw this purple thing, and I climbed down over the bank. And you know this beautiful roaring brook going by, and there's a um, had to have been at least a year old bag, plastic ripped plastic bag full of dirty diapers. Oh. And I thought that's it. I'm not doing anything with this. And I climbed <laughs> back up the bank, and I stood there, and I thought, no, I'm going back to get that because I'm going to be up all night thinking about this. Mm -hmm. And so I went back, and I had gloves on, and I got it. And then just down the road there was a. Um, somebody had taken a Rubbermaid container and made a kitty litter box out of it. That had been thrown in the brook Ugh. with the kitty litter and the box and the top and the scoop. So um, that's bad. There probably weren't any bears right in that particular area. <laughs> yeah, Ugh. it's a little sidelight. That's okay. Um, bears, bears are a fact of life up here. Yeah. Um, question about compostable. How are you pronounced? Where, where do you put the accent? Um, compostable utensils, and if they don't go into the compost, they go in the trash. Mm -hmm. they, they're not recyclable, so. I hate them. Okay, say more. <laughs> you just keep feeding me these prompts and I go <laughs> off and. Uh, compostable, compostable wear is, in my, my opinion of it, it's greenwashing. Um, if you have a compostable, uh, I tell this story about a restaurant that I, in Ludlow, and I was down doing outreach, and I was just after the law had passed about um, food scraps, and I said, I walked in and I said, what are you doing with your um, you know, food scraps? And this, the owner was so thrilled, he said, we couldn't find a dishwasher, we've, so we've gotten rid of all of our washable plates and silverware, and we've mm. got, we're gone to all compostable. And it turns out that he'd spent an enormous amount of money buying all this compostable wear, and his hauler said, oh, we don't take compostable. <gasps> and the, the worst offender is the, is the plastic, the clear plastic glass or cup that looks like a number one plastic, and it's made out of plant-based. And so what happens is that if you, if you take that plant-based compostable cup and you throw it in with your recyclables, you've just contaminated your whole roll of recycling, mm. the whole thing of recycling. And it's the same way, um, they're gonna, you know, people, someone's gonna hear this and, and call me and start ranting, but just like I am. But the compostable, um, they, they, they don't break down in a backyard compost. They take a really long time to break down in a commercial composting facility. And um, the Intervale compost up in Burlington uh, two years ago stopped accepting any compostable ware of any kind because um, they could deal with their facility would break down true compostable utensils after a while. But what was happening is that people were throwing PET number one plastics mm. in. So they had to say, we're not, no, no more, no more. So um, what I have to say about compostable ware is um, please don't buy it. Um, it's, it, it, it can't be recycled, and it, a lot of it doesn't break down. Um, so, you know, if you're going to a picnic, bring a reasonable plastic plate and a glass and your fork and knife. Uh, there's these great things called 
Oh, I didn't bring it with me. I have a set called, uh, it's called To Go Wear. It's a bamboo fork, knife, and spoon and chopsticks. And it comes in a little canvas pouch and you attach it to your hmm. backpack or your whatever. And uh, I carry that everywhere with me. And, um, you know, if you can get to the, if you're getting out, take out food, if you can stop the person before they shove plastic utensils in your bag, you say, no, 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 I don't need them. Um, so, so a specific question hmm. to get cups for our water cooler, which we have to have being a public place. Mm -hmm. We don't have the facility to have glassware. Yep. We're not a restaurant. Um, would you go back to recycled paper cups instead of trying to do compostable or recycled plastic, which I can't, I, that, I can't even say it. I know. Um, well, the problem with paper cups is that they're, no, they're not lined with wax anymore. They're lined with plastic. That's what so I was they're, wondering. They're not recyclable. And um, what, what was the other, the other option was? Uh, Cap, I, you know what? It, it's probably a number f one PET plastic. I use plastic cups. Wow. I hate to say that. I mean, I, I'm wow. joking on that, but. Um, well, I mean, this is a conversation we're having this afternoon. So this is really, I mean, it's, there are times when you can't do washable, reusable stuff. Well, if you, but the other thing, if you get compostable wear, and by the way, if, you, if you're forced to buy compostable wear, make sure that it has the symbol on it that says BPI, BPI certified. That's the only kind of compostable wear you should buy. Uh, and I mean, if, you're, if you get that, I suppose you could take that to, um, I don't know, Zach, Music Mountain takes compostable wear. He loves it, and he's you know he's new at it. He said, "I'm trying this. I'm taking. I'm doing experiments with different piles." So um, okay, we could try it. Yeah, try that. But but in in without that, with not using the compostable, it's better to go with a recyclable plastic than a plastic lined paper. That's my personal opinion because the plastic lined paper cup is going to the landfill, and if it's a PET number one plastic cup, it can go with your recycling. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Why does Casella not want to take number one uh, egg cartons? I don't know that. Hmm. Yeah. They said no egg cartons. And I said even... But it's bigger, it, which seems like it was big enough to. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, I'm going to have to write that down because that's something I, I don't know. I mean, I learn something every time I come to one. Yeah, PT number one. All right. You know, I also spoke to Sella one time about number fives. I said, you take, I understand you take number fives. And she said, yes, but as long as they haven't had any food in them. And I said, what? Hmm. And um, so, you know, I think there's possibly management isn't getting the word out to the there's masses. A, there is a big um, the, gap. There is a gap between uh, customer hauler yeah. office. Um, there just there just is. Yeah. Yeah. What about um, you know the styrofoam things that you uh, get a sandwich in or something, but the, the newer kind that are supposed to be compostable, they're more like, uh, they're not paper, but they're some yeah. kind of material. Plant-based, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I don't know how I've to end. I've seen where some places have switched to that. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the um, Ironic thing is that um, people have switched from styrofoam to compostable. Um, there's a wonderful burger joint in, in Windsor called Mr. Um, uh, uh, Fraser's Place, which you should all try. It's the best burgers anywhere around. And um, they 
stopped using styrofoam two years ago as it was legislated, and they've gone to a, uh, looks like a, it's a brown, light brown cardboard, mm. but it's lined, as, as far as I know, it's lined with um, um, a, some sort of plasticized lining. Mm. And now there's this whole thing about, well, are there PFAs, PFAS mm. in them? So, you know, <sighs> you can't win. Yeah. Um, I do, I'm sorry, I don't have a, I don't have a definitive answer yeah. okay. about that. Um, I, 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 you know, if, if styrofoam is gonna start being recycled, then, you know, are we sometime gonna start going back to, going back to styrofoam? I don't, I hope not, but. What do the people in Lebanon do with their styrofoam? Uh, those styrofoam take out the trays and the styrofoam clamshells. Yeah. Um, are recyclable at this recyclable drive. Right, but what did they do with them? Um, did, they are, they are they trucked, are... no, they are trucked to, um, the, they, they rent two U-Haul box trucks. They drive them to Guilford, New Hampshire, which is over near Winnipesaukee, I think, um, and they, to their transfer station, and they raised money, the transfer station in Guilford purchased a foam densifier for $80,000. They got a lot of grant money. And you shove all of the big chunks of styrofoam into this machine. It gets densified. It comes out the side looking like a styrofoam rope. And there's a guy or gal there who's sitting there and they're folding this rope over and over into a box, specific box. And when you fill a box, that's called a, an ingot. And then they're loading the ingots into a giant tractor trailer, which is parked on site. And when the tractor trailer is full, they call this company called Suprema up in Canada. And Suprema comes down and picks it up, takes it back to their plant, and they make uh, home insulation hmm. and architectural molding. And some companies are making now picture frames out of it. But the cool thing about Suprema is that they're sending their foam insulation down to North Carolina to a, a vet who is um, started a company building tiny houses for vets. Mm. So, you know, there's a great, there's a great story. That was good. Yeah. That was good. Okay. So I think the paper is sort of clear. Uh, one question about paper. Yeah. Shredded paper. It's yeah, smaller than two inches. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, that's the best thing to well, do. So Don't shred it or, or, or use it for a compost or for, for uh, it can, I think it also can be used for like dairy bedding and rabbits and. Huh. Um, it also has window, envelope windows. Yes, it does. It. Yeah. Um, it can't go through, it can't go in your, in your single stream because uh, even if you put it in a bag, they don't want a bag. Yeah, right because it gums up the machinery. Yeah. Um, I, I honestly don't know what people do with shredded, with shredded paper. I've been putting mine in a clear plastic bag and the Casellos were taking it. Okay. What they do with it, but they... Well, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna, that's another question I'm gonna find out because it comes up and I uh, never really know what to tell. Do you have to bag it or can you? Well, if you don't, it's less than two inches. So you can't it, you can't put shredded paper in in a in your in the recycling. It's just it's loose and it it yeah. it, it, will, it makes a huge mess. In the, yeah. You know, once a year, um, we yeah. send to Woodstock. I send the shredder truck. Okay, oh, because I have. Yep. I save all my papers for them. Yeah. yeah. If you can hang on to it, it's great. I mean, people who are you know, if somebody's passed away and you're cleaning out a lot of mm -hmm. removing. Um, that, that's, a, that's a great idea. Also, the uh, Mascoma Bank hosts one a year at their office in si on Sykes Avenue in White River. Mm -hmm. Staples, you can. Staples, you can put in. You can. Oh, Staples, right. They're gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pam, are you willing to look at these to tell us why they are or aren't um, uh, recyclable? Um, 
these are all recyclable, I think, except for this. That is a, um, my judgment on that is that that's a plastic coating okay. on it. And um, I would, I put. How do we know the difference? Well. Could you, could you please say what, what is oh, the plastic coating for those of us? Yeah, 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 sorry. Um, this is a Land O'Lakes butter um, bot, a, okay. you know, carton of butter. And pretty much anything you put in your freezer that has food in it, well, what else would you put in your freezer? Um, it, you can be pretty sure that it's got a plastic coating on it. I see. Um, but this is, you know, a light bulb came in this, milk bones, that's fine. These are, you know. Tissue boxes. Tissue Thank boxes, you. yeah. So that's, that's my call on that. I've been looking at the, the brown side that, indicates paper mm -hmm. and um okay but I, i've been just confused about the shiny shiny's okay and it, yeah. uh, it, it to answer your question it is hard to determine um yeah. whether there's plastic you know whether it's got a plastic coating but normally i mean milk bones they're solid and they don't have to go in a in a yeah. refrigerator they probably wouldn't they wouldn't there would be no need to to coat it with plastic Butter is white on the inside. That's why it, it also felt much smoother than, than this. Yeah, much smoother, yeah. meaning plastic. Yeah. Um, did, did you ask I a question? I think a thing that would help too is if, um, if the haulers, the casellas, and I don't know about the others, but um, if they could do better with their. Uh, pamphlets about what is recyclable and what isn't. It's much too general, I think, and, and that would be helpful. One of the reasons they leave it general is because the, the rules keep changing, the market keeps changing, and that dictates what the, what the haulers want to take, what the recyclers want to take. I mean, one week, cardboard, the haulers could take a load of cardboard to a, a facility and get paid 180 bucks a month later, they could be paying 180 bucks to get rid of it, and it's just the demand. Um, and China. It's, it's also different New Hampshire to Vermont. Oh, yeah. The states have different rules too. So for these companies, for these you know border town regions, it, it makes it really confusing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I have to say, one good news is is that um, Vermont recycles way more batteries than any other state in the country. We do. We're I'm so, proud of us for that. Yeah, we've blown them um, out of the water. Everybody yeah. else. Yeah. Well, the fact that you can recycle batteries at all the town halls around here. Thank you, Ham. And um, Ace, you can recycle batteries and cell phone electrics here in the library. The um, friends sponsor a box right at the front back desk, the big green box, and we collect stuff. Um, that's great. I think making it easy is what's, what's you know, important. Before we had that, I used to put all my hearing aid batteries, in a, you know, in the, in a, in a bag and in the, um, it's like a laundry um, tub at the town hall. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it just makes it easy. So. Yeah. And it's got. It has to be convenient. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I, the, if a town doesn't have a transfer station, like Woodstock does not have its own transfer station, um, or a hardware store, um, I will put out a five gallon, usually they're kitty litter buckets, uh, in, in, in the, by the front door of the town hall. I have them in. That's cool. I don't know. But, <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, and, and again, anything that any of you can do, to help spread the word because the, one of our biggest frustrations at the solid waste district all over the state is how to get this information out. I have people calling me all the time and say, oh, I didn't know I could recycle batteries or do I have to put kitty litter in my paint can? No, um, but things that we live with, some of us 24-7, um, that we just take for granted and the, and the general public just doesn't you know, I think a lot of people see something in the paper about recycling and they say, ah, I don't want to read that. And so they don't learn something that they sort of need to know. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's also true that you don't necessarily absorb the information until you need to apply it. Exactly. Like, I learned, listened to you about compostables, but I couldn't answer the question this afternoon about what we should order for the water cooler because it, 
didn't apply at that point in time. Right. And so I think we're all learning, and things are changing, but we're all learning as we become aware of our purchases and use, which goes back to where I started. Full circle. It's just really paying attention. And it can be overwhelming at times, but if we all do what we can, it helps, you know. And, and we understand, we in Solid Waste to understand how frustrating it is for people. I mean, we, we deal, I, that's basically what I do, is I deal with the public, people calling me. And I had a woman t call me today from West Fairley, and she said, uh, I shouldn't even identify the town, but um, she said, what do I do with, I called the state, and I got your, they gave me to your number, what do I do with a uh, microwave, or the toilet, and an old bathtub? <laughs> and so... I started in telling her, you know, the microwave is an electronic, but it's not covered by the state, and the toilet, you can, uh, you can go to Hartford, but you have to have a sticker for Hartford. And she interrupted me, and she said, you know, this is the problem with Vermont, is that they want, you know, Vermont wants to be the environmental leader, and, and they make all these rules in, up in Montpelier, but they don't have the, the facility, whatever, to follow through with them. And... Um, so, you know, I, I, I think I got her calmed down, but, um, you know, she said, my I'm doing this for my daughter, and my daughter works on Saturdays, she can't go to the dump. And, you know, I just tried to explain to her, this is Vermont. We have 600,000 people here. We are a rural state, and we don't have the conveniences of um, metropolitan Boston or New York or suburbia or wherever. Um, and it's hard for people who, you know, a lot of people are moving up here. I had a woman call me a couple of years ago. I know we have to stop. Um, <laughs> she said, I'm from Thetford. And um, she said, my husband and I just moved from Long Island. And uh, my husband is out raking leaves. And we've got them all in plastic bags. What do we do with them? And I said, well, how many acres do you have? And she said, um, we have 10 acres. And I said, what's on those 10 acres? Well, trees, mostly trees. I said, well, have your husband um, take those bags out in the woods, dump them under the trees where they came from. And it was like a light bulb went off to her. Mm -hmm. And she showed up at our styrofoam collection. I can't remember her name, but she pulled up to the styrofoam collection in April. She rolled down her window. She said, hey, Ham, it's the woman from, with the leaf from Thetford. And we both burst out laughing. But it's that, you know, you got to make adjustments right. when you come here. It's a different world. Yeah. Um, it's it's uh, yes. applied knowledge. Yes, please. You're supposed to ask questions. You will not want me to ask you. How old am I? And did I say I'd get back to you? And I never did. Well, I don't know if you said that, but you said you, you didn't know. Yeah, I, uh, because you have to empty the, the uh, you have to empty the so liquid. What, drill a hole or something into it? Because um, right? there's no outlet from this. No, thing. no. I don't even know. I'm assuming it could be oil or... I think it's like kerosene. I have no or, idea what's in there. It's oil. Um, is there a way to, I mean, is there, if you had some strong person tip it upside down, would, could they empty it out for you? I, I don't think there's an outlet. Okay. Um, well, maybe. Uh, I should know your, <laughs> no, 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 I, I, and I should know your name. I, I, oh, Ellie Fazani. Thank you. I've seen you for. I used to mistake you for somebody else. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the metal recycler in Wilder, you might... Evergreen. Evergreen, okay. Um, I have been, I've been down there and, and run into somebody one time and asked if uh, I could yeah. dispose of, could get rid of this. And it, oh, it was a hose reel with rubber tires. And he said, sure, we'll take it. So, I mean, if you, if you can find them, maybe they can tell you directly whether they can take it or not. It's called Evergreen Recycling. They're great. We work with them all the time. But, um, Ellie, hang out for a minute afterwards, and I'll get your contact okay. information. Yeah. What about the public recycling in town where people put plastic 
it's a mess. Of iced coffee, and you obviously, or whatever, and obviously you can't wash them out mm -hmm. when you're not at home or something. Um, does that all just get contaminated, and then is none of it recycled, or how does? <sighs> The problem I find with these containers in Woodstock and other towns is that um, and they've done studies that say if you put a recycling bin farther than, if a recycling bin is farther than five feet from the trash can, people won't walk the five feet to recycle something. <laughs> They'll put it in the trash can. So, um, and I think in Woodstock there, it's one unit, right? There's recycling, yeah. Um, if it's only recycling in there and, they're, and, they're, and there's not trash in there, um, their chances are the lid's probably in there, the straw's probably in there. Um, I, I honestly can't tell you what happens to that. But the, what, from what I've seen, um, there's, there's recycling in the trash and there's trash in the recycling. And my bet is that Casella or whoever picks up comes through and that all goes in the Packer truck and goes mm. to the landfill. Unless there's some, well, you had that problem. We talked about that. You were going to have a, you wanted to have a recycling bin in here. And I think mm -hmm. I talked you out of it because. Mm, well, we, we have, they're at the top of the stairs. We're experimenting. Right. Yeah. Unless there's somebody there saying, no, that goes in there, that goes in there. People are on the go all the time. They're not thinking about it. They just, you know, mm -hmm. see a container. And that's yeah. your problem. So. I don't think the unwashed cup necessarily would keep it, despite what Casella said about having to wash out. Would it? I don't know that it. I don't know that that was what they meant to wash it out, because everything is unwashed. Everything out. Right. But so, yeah. I, 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 I'm guessing that if if that container is full of just recyclables and there's some iced tea left in one, mm -hmm. that that those will be recycled. That's what I would hope. And because you know it's impractical to think that somebody's walking down the street's going to be able to rinse out their latte or whatever. That's a good question. Other questions? I w we promised you that you'd, you'd have you could have questions here, and we've been been I've been talking a lot. <laughs> uh, excuse me, uh, this is Barbara um, on Zoom. Um, is there a a list? on some website for Vermont that says which electronics are allowed. I heard you say that somebody's microwave was not allowed. So how does one know which electronic types of things are allowed? Um, there is a website. If you, if you Google um, Vermont solid waste or Vermont, uh, yeah, or no, Ver, I call it, what, Google Vermont electronics or Vermont e-waste and you will see a list. Um, it's, yeah, it's confusing. I mean, all, there are really no electronics that should go in the landfill in Vermont, but the only ones that, you, that are required, that, that cannot go in the landfill are um, computers, computer peripherals, and television sets. But the other ones can be recycled. You just have to pay for them. You have them. to pay. And depending, I mean, Hartford, you take your, your microwave to Hartford and they might charge you 10 bucks. If you take it, if you live in another town and you take it to your uh, transfer station, they might not charge you anything. But yeah, they, the transfer stations are allowed to charge for other electronics beside mm -hmm. those ones that I mentioned. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a lot of great information on that website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, any other questions? We're, we're talking about building a resource page with the website and other things mm -hmm. that, that Ham can feed us on the, on the website. So coming out of this and information about our certification and all that stuff. So we're working on that. So stay tuned. And there's some literature on the credenza there. Oh yeah, um, and I just have a couple of things. I have bullet points here and I'm not gonna go through them all, but I just wanna make sure that I'm not missing something that has to be spoken about. Uh, two hazardous waste collections this year. One is on July 22nd, and they're both at Hartford. One is July 22nd, one is September 12th. We'll be advertising those a lot. Um, if the Solid Waste District holds Saturday collection events in certain towns, 
uh, those are open to anybody. Um, we're, we tend to do them in the more outlying towns like West Fairley, Stratford, Thetford. But you are, if you, you're welcome if you want to drive something up there to, to drop it off for a very nominal fee. We also collect tires then, and um, oh, it's bulky waste tires and, and electronics. Um, I think I got everything. And I'm just going to, yeah. Um, here's a fun-filled fact. The Container Recycling Institute estimates that, 36, that the 36 billion aluminum cans that are landfilled every year in the United States have a scrap value of more than $600 million. And over the past 20 years, we have scrapped aluminum cans worth over $12 billion dollars on today's market. I don't know when that was. And that is enough to rebuild the entire commercial airline fleet in the United States four times over. Oh my gosh. That's just aluminum cans. Could have built an airplane out of the Bud Light cans I picked up last Saturday. Hmm. Um, I think that's, that's all that's, that's uh, my cards are on the table with co my contact information. I love getting phone calls, uh, and I love answering questions and, and helping people. I got three calls just today for about three different things, and uh, it's, I enjoy it. So please feel free to, no, no question is too silly. You're so good at it. <laughs> you really. <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm passionate about it. Uh, okay, well, thank you all yeah, for coming. You. This is good, good thank questions. You. A lot of information.